So, hi, uh, my name is Jason Ross. I work with uh, the LaRouche Basement Research Team. And I was going to talk about metaphor, which artificial intelligence will never understand. But uh, we're going to get into what metaphor is, but hopefully I'm going to get across what the key is to scientific thinking as opposed to the way a computer might think. Because there's some things computers can figure out. You know, I've seen uh, they make this new vacuum cleaner that's a little circle that moves around on your carpet all by itself. So that's something, you know, a computer can figure that out. You know, they have automated car washes. You know, there's things like that. But there's some things a computer can't do. So, uh, okay, so first I want to talk about what makes us unique as a species, totally unlike anything else in life. Then talk about metaphor and then get at what the point of all this is. So for starters, here's a chart that, okay, even if this title up top didn't say it, this is a population chart. So the years go back to, you know, 100,000 BC or so. Here they're at 400 BC, and then here is uh, almost the present, 1975. And this is population. So you can see it's going up. Now, this pretty much only could have been the human species. Or what other species might it have been that went from a very, this level of, you know, maybe 10 on this scale to 2,500 years ago, up to now a level of 650? I think this might just be European population. But can anybody think of a species besides people that might have that kind of growth? Rabbits. <laughs> Rabbits? That's it. Bacteria. Bacteria? Well, here, yeah, maybe domestic animals along with people. Well, rabbits, see, the thing is, rabbits didn't first come into being in 400 BC. I mean, if you had a particular batch of rabbits, it might do this. But if we just said all rabbits in the world. Maybe if rabbits had just come into being, maybe a new species that was just able to, maybe some kind of plant that was able to move onto land. When plants came out of water onto land, you might see this kind of growth. But other than a new species coming into being, the, I can't tell what you said. Molecular size. Oh, tiny things? Yeah, maybe if something new was developed. But this is, this is something that's basically unique to the human species. If you're looking at species that have existed this long, there's none that waited that much time to jump forward, except maybe cockroaches or domestic animals or, you know, things that like to live with us. So it's, you know, like house cats, you know, they've shot up, you know. Uh, poodles. <laughs> There might not have, there probably wouldn't have been any of those in nature without people, right? So how is it that we do that? Because that's, that's definitely unique to us. However, here's a chart that's about all life. So this is a total diversity and number of genera. Genera means that you've heard of genus and species. If you have more than one genus and you're trying to sound smart, you don't say genuses, you say genera. So that's what that word is. So general is supposed to specific, anyway. So here, again, this is uh, millions of years, 540 million years of time. And we've seen the number of different kinds of genera shoot upwards. Um, I think this is only water, marine, uh, marine life. Now, that does look like human life. But here you're looking at life as a whole, that overall life has become more complex. There's more variety. You also see some very significant drops here. Now, I don't think we've seen a drop that big in recent history in human population, although this is the sort of drop we're looking at right now if we have world thermonuclear war. Now, here's another comparison. This is a, this is a chart, it's a little funny to read. The purple part is animals that can't swim around. So like a barnacle is only water, uh, marine animals. Like a barnacle or a sponge or maybe like a tube worm, I don't think they can move or things like that. And then the green part is, you know, fish and things that are able to move around. So from 540 million years ago, very few things could move. So if you lived in the ocean, I hope you like where you live because you can't go anywhere else. <laughs> now today, what is this number? About 25%. Today, 75% of living things in the ocean are able to move. We've got <laughs> lots more fish. And the number of sponges that are still doing their job being sponges and barnacles and things like that, it's much less of a portion of it. It wasn't a continuous drop, though. 
You can see how there seem to, there, there are these, it's almost like walking up steps. Yeah, so it's almost like this is a sort of stage where there's a certain ratio of free moving and, and stationary life. Here we have a different stage, and here yet another one. So that if you think about what LaRouche talks about, about economic platforms, that if you want to look at the economy, instead of looking at all the individual things in it, look at what's the whole platform. What, what is mankind standing on? What are we able to do? When we developed, when we discovered that germs cause diseases, that increased what we're able to do. Now you actually know that you ought to, uh, you know, sterilize your surgical equipment between patients, for example. You wash your hands. Yeah, that's a much more common thing, right? <laughs> wash your hands. Some people haven't gotten that one yet. Wash your hands. When you sneeze, you know, try to keep it somewhere, cover your cough. You know, those things help. Or uh, electricity, or development of agriculture. If you're only catching fish and walking around looking for berries, how many people can you support? Compare that to if you're saying, why don't I plant this seed and then I know where I'm going to find my berries or wheat or corn or whatever you're planting. So these kinds of changes that we do as one species, in life, you have to look at all of life. You've got to look at evolution. It's much bigger. Now, oh, here's another one. OK, anyway. Now, if we specifically look at one of the factors that increases our ability to do things, it's fire. Now, fire doesn't just make food taste better. Um, well, that's one of its purposes. It's got many, you can do a lot of things with fire. And you can do a whole lot more things when that fire is burning coal instead of wood. Can anybody think of why it's better to burn coal than wood? What, 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 how that helps? Mm -hmm. Sure does. It's a lot easier to carry it around. That's true. It's a lot denser. Yep. Petroleum. Even denser. You know, this leaves out some, like charcoal in between wood and coal, or, or producing coke. Um, I even, you know, people say that even if we had a nuclear, like most of our power was made by a nuclear process, for production of steel, you would still want coke, which is a, something you do with coal, you make coke, because it burns so hot, you would still need that in the, coal in the steel production. So you just look, I mean, these numbers, then they really shoot up once you get fission, uranium, which is our current nuclear plants, deuterium, this is fusion, so this is, we've only seen that in tested bombs so far, unfortunately, and in, um, on a small scale in test fusion facilities where we are able to create fusion. And then antimatter. So just look at, look at the gain we've gone from wood to petroleum. Three times more energy in the same weight of substance. And then compare that to deuterium. Ten million times more. Ten million times more. And people have probably seen those demonstrations where a piece of uh, uranium fuel the size of the tip of your pinky is the same as, you know, a thousand barrels of oil or whatnot in terms of a power plant. That's uranium. Well, fusion's a thousand times more energy dense than that. So just to Im imagine what we'd be able to do with that. Be able to take a rocket and go to Mars and be able to have, the, you know, have your ga foot on the gas pedal the whole way. <laughs> right now, the plans to go to Mars, you basically you launch and then you just sort of coast until you get to Mars and then you hope nothing broke. And then you have to wait there for a few months. Well, you could, hopefully you wanted to go there. So you know, you spend a few months there, you're enjoying your trip on Mars, hopefully nothing breaks. Because if it does, you can't leave until your specific launch window. And then you sh launch off and you have to wait until you get back to the Earth. That's using you know, these kinds of energy sources. With fusion rockets, we could actually just fly to Mars and it would just take a week. If something goes wrong or somebody gets sick, you could bring them back to Earth. You wouldn't just say, well, I'm sorry, I guess we won't let people with uh, bad health go to Mars anymore. <laughs> we'll have more stringent screenings. No, no. That's where we're going to move. But, okay, now let's, uh, how do we do all of this? What is it that human beings do that lets them have these kinds of things where animals don't? Because animals, they don't change their relationship to nature. Sometimes, maybe your domestic animal will get you to help change its relationship to nature. <laughs> You know, your dog sounds hungry, your cat's purring and rubbing against your leg, you know, maybe you'll give it some food and it didn't have to go out and find it itself. But animals don't develop new sorts of fire. They don't use fire at all. 
Unless spite, yeah, yeah, they don't use fire. <laughs> okay, so, um, so metaphors is the main subject here. P who's heard the word metaphor before? Now, does anybody remember what you, what, what are some things people heard metaphor means? A comparison does not use like or as. Okay. That's what I heard too. Okay, any other ones? Anyway. That's what we all got in school. <laughs> A comparison that does not use like, when it uses like or as, what's it called? Simile. All right. Get a sticker on the board right here. <laughs> now, Mr. LaRouche says, no, that's, that's, there's a little bit more you got to have to have a metaphor. You know, a metaphor is a comparison, you know, and with this sort of school definition, it, it doesn't convey the same sort of importance that, uh, here, let me, here's what LaRouche says. He says that metaphor doesn't relate to a particular explicitly direct object or set of objects, it refers to an implied simultaneity among a very special quality of several indirectly related objects. I know that's a mouthful. I think some examples will help make this clear. The point I want to drive at is that metaphor is a means by which we create new ideas that don't have any reference to what we've seen before. Sometimes when you get a new thought, when somebody gets a new idea, there's something in your mind now that wasn't there before. You might know the steps that helped you get to it, but as we're going to see when we go through how Kepler made uh, his discovery, you've created something new that you didn't have before, that a computer couldn't have arrived at from what was already existent. It's really something new. How do you make something that's really new? It's not just comparing things that already exist, unless it's in a way that shows that there's something else there that couldn't have existed before. Now let's get into it. So first off, and if you've seen these before, don't spoil it. Okay, I've got a mystery object. I've got a square screen, and I've got a mystery object behind it that's moving around. So you can try and guess. Did everybody see that? It's, they're kinda, it's gray on gray, so it's kind of hard to see. See how there's this shape here? It's a very simple shape. Okay. Yeah. So there's something behind the screen. Think silently to yourself, what's probably behind the screen? If I pull it away, what will I see? Just imagine that in your head. Here's another object. Behind another screen. It's moving around. You can kind of guess. You can think what might be behind it. Okay. All right. What if those were actually the same object? What could it have been? What could look like both of these different things? a cylinder. Right? Now, if you just saw one of the views or the other one, you would say, oh, it's a, it's a pizza box, or maybe you'd say it's a basketball or something. When you put the two together, you're able to figure something out that just one of the views wouldn't have told you. And maybe you could have guessed, without giving it away, what looks like a circle on one side and a square on the other. Maybe you could have guessed, if you, you know, if you tried for a while and it didn't, you know, just show you in 10 seconds, you probably would have guessed a cylinder. Let's take another look at this, about what it, what it means to combine two different perceptions to get something new. We're going to look at the work of Johannes Kepler, who was the first modern scientist. He was an astronomer in particular, and he was the first person to bring physics into astronomy. See, back then, people would write books where they would calculate whether the Earth went around the Sun, or the Sun went around the Earth, or, or various things like that. And they'd also write books where they said what the heavens were made out of. Like, are there spheres like out of, made out of glass that carry the planets around us? Are, there, uh, are the stars bits of light poked in, a, in like a big sieve? Are they their own fires? What are they? Those were two completely different departments. You either were a mathematician who would write down where you would see the moon on a certain day. So you can do your horoscopes in advance and go on vacation, if that's what you do for a living. Or you would write about the physics behind it but they were totally separate. 
Kepler said that was ridiculous because if the planets moved, it was for a reason. So let's look at what he came into. So this is Ptolemy. Well, that's not actually him. This is a, uh, this is a picture of how he thought things worked. People may have heard of him. He said that the Earth is in the middle of the universe, which is easy to see if you just go out and watch the stars one night. If you watch them one night, it seems like everything moves around the North Pole, and it looks like a big sphere, so obviously we're in the middle. Now he said, well, the sun goes around the Earth, not just every day, but during the year also. If you, um, I don't have a picture of this, but you know how there's the zodiac signs in the, you know, in the newspaper or whatnot, it, and it says something about you that seems insightful but could have applied to anybody else also? Now, does anybody know what those signs mean? Like we're, where do they, why do they have the names that they do? Why is a certain date associated with a certain sign? Where did that even come from? Yeah. At the time he was born, when the sun directly meets, that exactly came out of birth at the very time the trajectory of the sun was at. And also the other sign is planetary positions also affect our lives, our lives as well. Right. And so, because when people look at I mean, it's a lot easier to see, when you look at the moon, I mean, I don't know how much stargazing anybody here does, but if you look at the moon, you might say, well, it's in a certain constellation. I know, it's kind of hard to see around here. <laughs> But the moon, you say, oh, the moon, it's next to these stars. OK, it's in this constellation. The moon is in Leo. The, your zodiac sign is where the sun was when you were born. Obviously, you can't see the stars that the sun is near because it's bright. And when it rises, you can't see the stars anymore. But if you knew where all the stars were and you figured out how much they moved, you could figure out where the sun was. So that's the path that the sun makes, all the constellations that it goes through. Those are the signs of the zodiac. And so when you're seeing this picture here, this is the sun going through the different signs of the zodiac, which I don't know in order, so I'm not going to, you know, it goes through Leo and then Scorpio and then Virgo or whatever the right order would be. That's what you're seeing here. Mars also moves through the sky. It moves through basically the same 12 constellations that the sun does. So Ptolemy says, well, yeah, Mars goes around the Earth too, but sometimes it looks like it goes backwards. Let's watch where we see Mars. Look, it's moving counterclockwise. And then look what's happening right here. It looked like it went clockwise a little bit. Do you see that? Mars does that. Every two years, Mars, if you watch all the stars it's next to, and you watch it night after night, it's moving through the sky. And then it, makes, it goes backwards, makes a loop-de-loop, -loop, and comes back. So Ptolemy said, well, if Mars just went around the Earth, it wouldn't go backwards. So Mars will go on another circle that goes around the Earth, and everybody's happy. So that's what Ptolemy said you know, uh, in about 150 AD. Copernicus. People have probably heard of Copernicus, right? Mm -hmm. Who's heard of Copernicus? Okay, okay well, yeah. <laughs> he, said that the sun, he said that the Earth moves. He said that the sun is in the middle of everything. And here's the Earth, and here's Mars, and now oh, Let's watch what happens when Earth passes Mars, because Earth's going around quicker. So the direction Mars appears to be, it's moving to the left. It's going through Virgo and Scorpio and Cancer and, you know, whatever. And then, uh, do you see how it went backwards a little bit? Yeah. So Copernicus said, my system's much better. First off, the sun is gigantic and it makes hot heat and light, and why couldn't it, you know, why couldn't it be in the middle of things? And you don't have to have that extra circle anymore. Now the planets all go backwards, not because they go backwards, but just because we walk faster than them. And it looks like they're going backwards, like someone on the street that you're passing. Now here's the next guy, Kepler's boss, for a little bit. His name was Tycho Brahe. He also had less circles than Ptolemy, but he said, OK, the Earth's in the middle, because it doesn't seem to move. The sun goes around the Earth. But the planets go around the sun. 
because that doesn't violate the Bible. So it's okay if the earth's still still. I mean, that was, that was part of the thinking. And then, you know, we'll do, we'll do things like this. This is, this is Kepler's boss. Now, here's the funny thing. A lot of people like Copernicus's theory, and they would use it when they did their calculations of where to find the planets, even though they thought he was completely wrong. They said there's no way the Earth moves. That's ridiculous. The Earth can't move. But I like doing, but they said, you know what? The way you laid out your formulas, it's easier for me to use. So I'll use your formulas, but Earth moving, ridiculous. If it moved, we'd all fall off of it. It's crazy. <laughs> You know, and in the book of Joshua, it says that the, the sun was made to stop, so that means the sun must move if it could have stopped, so therefore, you know, it's in other, other examples in the Bible. I'm not trying to paint out the church as being an awful institution or anything, by the way. Okay. Uh, anyway, so here's these guys. Here comes Kepler. Now, Kepler believes Copernicus is right, and he believes it for a different reason than Copernicus did, because he doesn't think that mathematics makes things happen. All right. Like, just, if you just go about your daily life, do you ever see like mathematics making something occur? Like in the middle of a car engine, are there a bunch of like square root symbols and things like that that are making the pistons move up and down, or is it that there's actually a gasoline catching fire, expanding, pushing it out, it's turning it? There's something real that's happening there. You know, if you have a, yeah, I mean, you know, it, mathematics is isn't real. You use it to describe things, but it, it's never why something happens. That's why you say why did it happen? There's a real cause for it. So Kepler said, duh, the sun's in the center, not just because it likes the view to watch all the planets. It's making them move. The motion is related to the sun. Planets move faster when they're near the sun. This is what Kepler thought, that the sun was physically making this happen. Now, even his good friends told him, I like your ideas about uh, astronomy, but you've got to really knock it off with this idea that the sun's making anything happen. Because you're trying to bring physics into astronomy. They said, don't do that. That's ridiculous. Astronomy is about calculating. Physics, you can say all day what you think the heavens are made out of, but it doesn't really matter. That's just sort of chatting. But when it comes to calculating, just stick with the calculating. Don't bring in your physics nonsense. So this is the sort of atmosphere he was in. It was pretty hostile to the work he was trying to do, where even people who liked him and supported him still felt completely weirded out. But I'm sure they, that's not the word they'd use, but they were made very uneasy. They shuddered at the thought of something physical causing motion. So here's what Kepler does. First thing he does is he shows that these three guys aren't different at all. That if you just look at where will the Earth see the Sun or Mars, they're all three the same thing. It's just you rearranged which point you're standing still on. You just rearranged your, your, your things mathematically, but nothing's really different. That was the first thing that he showed. Then, he wanted to go in and show that there is a difference between, see, one thing I didn't say, Mars's orbit. Does anybody know what's at the center of Mars's orbit for Copernicus? What's right in the middle? Nougat. Nougat? <laughs> no, not, not the planet. <laughs> the orbit. <laughs> Mars moves around. the sun, right? No. Copernicus did not use the sun for anything. If you calculated anything about any of the planets and set up their orbits, the sun never has anything to do with any of them. Do you know what is in the middle? Copernicus says, you can't see the difference on this, but Copernicus says, take the orbit of the Earth, find the middle of that circle, and that's what everything goes around. So even though Copernicus said the sun's in the middle, it's not. The Earth is still in the middle. The center of the Earth's orbit, that's what all the other planets go around. So Jupiter somehow has to know where the center of the orbit of the Earth is and go around that, even though the sun is like, you know, 20 feet away. I mean, it's more than that, but it's basically, so Copernicus, he never really, he never really made the sun in the middle. Kepler showed that even though all three of these were equivalent, and you couldn't prove which was right based on doing observations, he did prove that if you use the real sun instead of the center of the Earth's orbit, that then there would be a difference, and that it was a big enough one that if you calculated based on the real sun versus the fake sun, you could decide who was right. So Kepler decided to launch into, he said, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make, I'm going to use the real sun. I'm going to do it. And I'm still going to use the same techniques that these other guys did. 
for starters. I won't bring in the physics yet. You told me you don't like physics, fine. I'll use mathematics. I'll have it your way. He had a surprise in store for them. So here's what he did. He, oh, I can turn the lights off for a second. I wanted to make fun of Ptolemy a little bit more. <laughs> okay, so here's Ptolemy's system. All the planets have these spheres that they're in, which are very faint. You can barely see them. You know, it's like Mars is green for no good reason. And you know, you need this. Not zooming in. Like you wrote. Anyway, so here's Mercury. Here's Venus. Here's the Sun. There's the Earth in the middle. So here's this whole, you know, he's got this whole system. Um, I wanted to do something fun with it, though. Here's the three outer planets, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars. I'm adjusting their epicycles, the extra circles, so that they're all the same size. I have to change the orbits to do that. You notice anything these three have in common? Right. Now I put in the sun. For Ptolemy, who said the Earth's in the middle, all of the planets move on little circles that are coordinated exactly with the sun. Now that might make you think maybe the sun has got something to do with these planets' motion, right? <laughs> nah, not him. Either that or he knew and he's doing this wrong on purpose. Now I want to take a look at Mercury and Venus. This is even more shocking. Let's zoom in. Let's take a look at Mercury and Venus. I want to make Mercury's orbit bigger. I, it doesn't change where I see it. I'm just going to make it bigger so it's the same size as Venus. We're getting there. OK. Hmm. The center of their epicycles is at exactly the same spot. It's the sun. So Ptolemy, I didn't change Ptolemy's system. I just changed their relative sizes. It's equivalent to saying Mercury and Venus go around the sun. He, there's no way he didn't know that. But he still didn't talk about that. He went right ahead and he said the sun's in the middle of uh, the earth's in the middle of everything. He knew that. He's just a liar, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, there's no way he didn't notice that. Okay. Anyway. Oh, okay. Anyway, enough of that. In fact, you could say, if uh, if um, what's his name, Ptolemy lived on the moon. You know, he might have a lunar, lunatic model. Here you got the moon in the middle. You got the earth going around the moon. You've got the sun going around the moon on a little epicycle. And you've got Mars on an epicycle, that, on a thing that goes around the Earth, which goes around the moon. That's also completely equivalent. You can make up anything you want, and it's exactly, in other words, if you're just playing with math and lines, you're never really getting at the truth. This works just as well. You could do all the calculations, saying everything went around the moon if you wanted to. So I'm just saying. All right. I forgot this, so there's no flash here. All right, now, um, okay, so let's, let's, now let's get into what Kepler's doing. First, he realized that using one sense isn't enough. I'll show you an example why. When we see the sun in a certain constellation, in its sign of the zodiac, the sun sees us in the opposite direction. So if you time out how long the seasons are, because the seasons are different lengths, and it changes over time. I forget what the exact numbers are right now, but like, like summer is 94 days and fall is 90. I made, those are the right numbers with the wrong seasons. Anyway, only based on knowing a direction, you could say that the Earth moved on, on this orbit or on this orbit, or you could say it moves on this orbit. They all, they all have the right directions. There's no distances in astronomy. When you look up and see a star, you've got no idea how far away it is. Right? It could be a light hanging on somebody's porch or something, or across the way, I don't know. You know, it's, you, you can't really tell. So what Kepler did is he decided to stand on Mars <clears throat> to take a second look at the Earth. So from the Earth, we see the Sun and Mars. If we just imagine what they would have seen, we can imagine that the Sun and Mars are watching us. Now, every Mars year, Mars is back where it used to be. It's been one year for Mars. So if you keep doing this, look, we're able to watch the Earth from the Sun and Mars at the same time. We're able to really see what its orbit is. Kepler used this to figure out something about the Earth that I'm not going to get into right now, but it's really interesting. OK. What if, so there we use the Sun and Mars together to look at the Earth. Now let's get at the metaphor thing. 
What if we're combining something? What if we're making a comparison without using like or as, where we're also not able to bring the two things together? That sounded vague. Here we go. We'll see what, see what I mean. I know I'm saying what. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Now we're going to get into metaphor where we're going to combine two perceptions, but it won't, it won't resolve itself. With this one where the Earth, Sun and Mars are both watching the Earth, they both sort of see the Earth, you put it together, you find out where the Earth is. It's a great way of using two observations together, but it's not metaphor yet. The next example we'll look at when we combine two different ways of looking at something, and you can't resolve it. Where it's a puzzle that doesn't have an answer yet. That's the way you create a new idea. You've got a puzzle that doesn't yet have an answer yet in your mind, and you've got to think of something new on the spot. That's when you really get your juices going, right? So, okay, first off, here's another bit of math I've got to show you. Ptolemy also realized that in addition to Mars going backwards sometimes, the amount that it went backwards would change around its orbit. So he brought in a special, an extra, he broke the center in half, and he said, here's the center of motion as opposed to the center of distances, which makes the circle of, of Mars. This equant, Mars looks like it's moving at a uniform speed around this point here. So these angles are all the same. They're all 45 degrees. Like these eight spots of Mars, they'd all look like they're just as far apart from the equant's point of view. From the sun's point of view, look, the angles are different. Mars definitely looks like it's farther apart here than these two spots. Even though the equant would say that these two spots are the same distance away as these two spots. What it means is that Mars looks like it moves fast here and looks like it moves slow here. So I just wanted to bring that in, that Ptolemy uses this equant point. That's the math that Kepler is going to go with. Because they said, don't bring in physics, use mathematics. He said, OK, I'll use this mathematical trick to make the planet change its speed, even though it would be much easier to just let the sun make it go faster. But fine, have it your way. So let's see how he, ha he lets them have it their way. Next thing is that he has to make very special observations. When the sun, Earth, and Mars are all lined up, then when we look at Mars, when we look at Mars, the sun's stand looking over our shoulder, right? Like they're all three in a line. So wherever we saw Mars, the sun would have seen Mars in the same direction. So by taking these observations, it's like we're standing on the sun. This is how Copernicus would say, let's remove the motion of the Earth. The Earth moves, and that makes the planets look like they're moving. Plus, they're also just moving. To separate those two things, let's only look at Mars when it's on a line. Sun, Earth, Mars. That way, the, where the Earth is doesn't matter. The Sun is watching Mars. OK. So then, so Kepler, Kepler, he does it. He figures out the perfect way to make the model for Mars. He's like, all right, there's a certain distance between the Sun and the center of the circle. There's a certain distance between the center of the circle and the equant. And he tests it out. And it, it, it works absolutely perfectly. I mean, like, perfectly. The maximum error that this thing gets is so tiny that it's basically imperceptible. This is, all, this is before telescopes. So everyone's making observations just with their eyes. And they're still able to be precise to a 60th of a degree. So you imagine you've got 360 degrees break that down to one degree, break that into 60 parts, that's how accurate Tycho Brahe's observations were just using his eye. This is, he did it by having incredibly big protractors, basically, so that you could, I mean, that's what they were, a like, big protractor. Anyway, so Kepler's got this model. He calls it his vicarious hypothesis. What does vicarious mean? Living through someone else. Right. Kepler calls it his vicarious hypothesis because he thinks that whatever is really making the planets move, he's going to let it live through something else. Math. 
In other words, Kepler's just making it very clear, I don't really believe in this at all, okay? This is my vicarious hypothesis. Whatever's real, we're going to let it live through the equant point. Sounds like fun, living vicariously through a mathematical point, huh? Anyway, so Kepler makes this. It's great. It's perfect. But then he wants to check something out, because there's this distance here between the sun and the center of the Mars orbit. Right? I wonder if we need that open. <laughs> OK. All right, so we got this distance here. So uh, yep, OK, we got that distance there. Kepler wants to double check that distance. Because this isn't, this distance, you know, he didn't measure the, di you know, how big Mars's orbit was or anything like that directly. He just figured, hey, if, if I put things here, the math works out great. It's not physics, it's just math so far. So now he's going to bring in something else. Instead of looking at the 12 signs of the zodiac, like the 12 signs of the zodiac, they're all along what's called the ecliptic. It's like the equator of our Earth. The Earth moves around the sun, and so we see this ecliptic. We also have latitude. How far off the signs of the zodiac are you? What Kepler does is he takes, he uses these latitudes, once this stops moving, I can show you. Instead of looking at them moving around the signs of the zodiac, if he looks at how far they go above or below it, he's able to measure the distance. Here's how he does it. Okay. So, oh. Actually, I needed that triangle still there. Anyway, he does it with some trigonometry. <laughs> um, up and still move. Anyway, anyway, you know, he could have done it. Well, there's a triangle there. You got the sun, you got the earth, and you got Mars. And if there's a marker here, I'll do it. There isn't. Okay. It's fine. Anyway, once he gets them, let me just show that again. When he's, he, he's able to measure how far away is Mars from the sun when it's farthest from the sun, and how far is it when it's closest to the sun. And you can take those two and find the middle. And you can say, how far is that from the sun? So here's a 3D thing. So the, the Earth is moving right along the equator, of the sun's equator, the ecliptic. So, boom, we know, we know where the sun sees Mars, its angle. We know where we saw Mars. We know this angle. Anyway, so we get this distance. We get this distance. Find the middle point. And then we get this. We get the distance there. So hopefully that, we can go through that in the, the Q&A if that, people want to get the details on that some more. Anyway, so he's got a distance that he measured very directly now. He knows how far the center of Mars's orbit is from the sun. Now let's compare that. It's bigger than what his model had before. The purple length is what he got that just worked perfectly. He said that worked, but it's just wrong. I know that the distance from the sun to the center of Mars's orbit, I know it's bigger. So why don't I adjust my model? Here he is, he's pulling that orange point out. What if I pull the center of the orbit out to be at where it's supposed to be? Is it still an OK model? It isn't. Look at these differences. See, here's where the sun saw Mars originally on the vicarious hypothesis. And here along this peach point, that's when it's been adjusted to take into account the distance that he measured. Eight minutes. Kepler finds out that there's a difference there of eight minutes between his perfect model that worked but had the wrong distance and his other model that has the right distance, but now it doesn't work. So you either get the longitude along the 12 signs of the zodiac, you get them right with the red point, or you get the distance above and below the zodiac right with the peach color point. But if you get the distance above or below it right, and the distance along the zodiac is wrong by eight minutes. You just can't have it both ways. Now, here it's like, when, remember when we saw that square and the circle, and ah, oh, they're both part of the cylinder? Here you've got one way of looking at it, longitudes. That's like a square. That's the red point. You've got the other way of looking at it, the latitudes, like the circle behind the screen. But now when you try to put them together to make the cylinder, they don't work. 
you say there's one thing here. Mars is moving. That's one, there's one planet there. But when I look at it this way, I get one result. When I look at it this way, I get something else. And I just can't mash the two together. It doesn't work. Now, Kepler never wanted it to work. Because remember, he doesn't believe that a mathematical point makes anything happen. He doesn't believe that there's some guy with a calculator writing out sines and cosines here in the empty space that makes Mars move. So he really wanted this to fail the whole time. Because his point was, he said, look, I did a better job than any of you guys have ever done. The red point did look perfect. I mean, it was as good as anybody's observations could have been. Ptolemy, he would be off by over a degree. Okay, so if you compare that to one or two minutes, 60th of a degree, Kepler's great. Even when it's eight minutes off, even that is the best thing anybody's ever made because he's using the real sun and not the center of the Earth's orbit. So if he was a lesser astronomer, if he didn't care, if he was just a mathematician, he'd say, good enough. We'll call it a day. I'll use the peach point. It doesn't give me the longitude exactly right, but it gets the latitudes right. Good enough. Maybe I can go somewhere in the middle and sort of compromise here. But Kepler said, no, these eight minutes are crucial to reform all of astronomy. He said the data is not wrong. His boss had these incredible protractors. He had great data. So if it's not the data and it's not his math, he's like, you know, he, he double checked his math so many times. He didn't just make a mistake. You know? <laughs> he spent like a year doing this, making this model. He said, well, the only thing that could be wrong is what? The assumptions. Two assumptions are made here. Planets move in circles. How do you know that? You don't. That was just an assumption. But there's some imaginary point that if it was watching the planet, it would look like it's always moving the same speed. How do you know that? That's an assumption. So Kepler showed that, because everyone else before him, they were all doing this stuff. They were all doing this mathematical stuff. So Kepler is basically, he's just proven now, you have to give up mathematics. Planets don't move by mathematics. Stop trying. I just tried harder than any of you were ever going to try. I went through all this work. I did the best job ever. It just doesn't work. So quit. That's, the, that's how he ends part two of his book, The New Astronomy. Part three of his book, he starts bringing in physics. He says, I think the sun is making the planets move. Let's start trying to work out how that would be. So he starts working out his thoughts on it, that if, if a planet's 10% you know, closer to the sun, it'll go 10% faster, etc. And he starts playing with this. Eventually, this, this, he, he is, uh, when he pulls this towards the end and he figures everything out, he realizes the planets move in a way that, I don't have a picture of this, but as they move, they sweep out an equal area in equal amounts of time. That is, if you had a string attached to the planet, connected to the sun, and the planet moves, the amount of area that you'd shade in, that measures the time of the planet. You know, they move that way, and they actually move in ellipses. And he didn't do that by trying out an ellipse. He's like, oh, forget the circle, let me try an ellipse. He wasn't, even, he wasn't going for an ellipse. He, was going, he figured out the way the distances had to change. He had a hypothesis about the sun acting like a magnet. And then he said, whoa, this makes an ellipse. Anyway, just because people think maybe he just tried an ellipse, like he pulled it out of his shape box. No, that's not what happened. So, um, okay, eight minutes, boom. So, so I don't know, somebody, let me turn the lights back on now. I'm talking about the, the dark stuff. <clears throat> so you say, well, what, so how do we use our senses then? Kepler just showed us that our senses don't show us reality. If you just try to take the measurements that you measure and then build up, build, try to build up how things work based on what you will see later, that doesn't work. The universe doesn't work in a way that you'll see things. It works because there's causes. So think about all of the senses that we have. We've got some that are built in. We've got, it's very convenient, right? We've got eyes, they're built in. We've got skin with all sorts of things in our skin, a whole bunch of different. You know, it's kind of wrong. You see you've got five senses, right? You've got sight, you've got hearing, you've got touch, you've got smell, you've got taste. Think about how many things are involved in touch. You feel hot, you feel cold, you feel prickly, you feel soft, you feel vibrations. Anyway, we got the built-in senses, but they're not any better than anything we have outside. They're more convenient, but just because we can't see a magnetic field, does that mean magnets don't exist? I'm almost done. Okay. No, you don't see magnets, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. 
right? There's a lot of things that you can't, you don't smell. That doesn't mean that they don't exist, right? So when we use our senses, yeah, they're very handy. But so is an oscilloscope. So is a spectrometer. You know, if you, you know, this is how we figured out what the stars are made out of. You look at the light coming from a star, pass it through a prism, and you see, whoa, this makes the same kinds of light as helium, which comes from the word, Greek word for sun, helos, right? Helios, right? So um, anyways, you've got to remember that we have these tools that are available to us, as well as the external ones. None of them are really, none of them really directly show us reality, and we shouldn't identify with our senses. They don't, they're convenient, but they're no better than, than, than other things. So in terms of what a, uh, okay, let's get to that. So in terms of how metaphor plays a role in everything, it's an approach to science that we need to bring back. Because a lot of what we've got right now is people get a whole bunch of data, and then they ask a computer, computer, figure out what happened here. And the computer makes a big math formula, and it says this is what's happening. That's different than a poet creating a new idea. That's different than Kepler bringing, di discovering universal gravitation. Totally new concept. No one had thought of that before. And it makes things happen, makes things happen. So for us, it's not just the way that we do science. It's not just the successful way to think. It's the purpose of being. I mean, the, the, we're, when, are we, when are we really most, and here's a funny thing. Because you might say, well, when are you really being yourself? Like, what do, there's a lot of ways you might answer that. You might say, if I had just had a lot of money and I could do whatever I wanted to the rest of my life, what would I want to do? Is that being yourself? No. Good. <laughs> Right. You probably could be something bad if you just, you know, anyway. Or you might say, you know, you might just say, well, you know, can I look inside my, can I find everything about myself by looking inside myself? Yes. Well, here's the thing, though. How do you respond to outside things? That's part of who you are, too. So you think about, you think about Kepler. I mean, I mean he, he, he really engaged himself in this work. I mean, this was hard work. He was not getting paid for doing a lot of it. Well, I mean, for some parts of it, but a lot, you know, he was, I mean, he died trying to collect a, a backdated paycheck that he'd never received. And he was like, went to go collect it, and he died on the way in a swamp or something. I mean, it was, it, it, it was rough for him. What was driving him to do this? And you think, who is this man? Who is he really? Yeah, there's an approach inside of him, but what brings it out? It wasn't just introspection. And there's a role for introspection. But he got to find out what his mind was capable of when he engaged it in something outside. Now, the biggest goal, I think, that, I mean, the main point for us as people, the main thing we need to do with culture to make it a good culture, is expose people to that aspect of themselves. That's the point of being human. You know, you, you see things like when curiosity landed. And people who had never even heard of curiosity three months before, they still got really excited about it because we did this awesome thing. So let me just say this, this thing to, to finish up then, is that uh, when it comes to how, how are you growing your economy, there are the nuts and bolts that you need. You know, we need to have enough food. We need to stop turning food into gasoline. We need to build Nawapa. We need to have enough water. We need power. We need to pass Glass-Steagall. We need these things. They're absolutely essential. We've got to remember that the source of economic growth is the mind's ability to think. And we've got to foster a society where you might say the highest role of government is to allow people to play a role in their lives in something that's way beyond what they, what they do with their personal lives, that goes way beyond their death. We say, hey, the point of government, it's not just to make sure that you don't have to pay too much to ride the subway. It's are you going to be able to look back at the end of your life and say you did something that was essential, you did something important. Is the government, do we have projects that people can participate in and feel that way? We have in the past. Right now, we don't. So these, these things, they're not just a mission to create economic growth, although they will. The space program will create all sorts of economic growth if we really launch it. NOAP will create all sorts of economic growth if we really launch it. And then think about the cultural aspect of it as well. What does that let people reflect on themselves as being? And how does that differ from what you get if you're told that really there's too many people and you are your carbon footprint and you might as well just go kill yourself uh, as long as it doesn't create any carbon? I mean, that's a disgusting thing, and that's this, that's this like, outlook that's taught everywhere. You get in school and places. Oh, well, let's take our environmental studies or whatnot. Okay, you suck, you're awful, you're destroying the earth, you really should be dead, but instead, just don't use styrofoam. You know, that's a compromise. We'll let you stay alive as long as you don't use a styrofoam cup and you fix your toilet when it leaks. 
Otherwise, we'll, we're going to, you know, gas you or something. Anyway, so, okay, that's, that's what I wanted to say. And now we can talk about it. <laughs>